سلاو لا بولي بينز يكا قلينا ولا and uh, let you know that organophosphate and uh, carbamate are popular compounds in the community uh, several times you might face it uh, being used in the uh, outdoor activities like in the field of agriculture and certain other situations it's in house in indoor or household activities like uh, insecticides and certain other situations like using them as repellents as is shown in this picture when you go outdoors you uh, apply a bit of kick uh, kick is the old solution was available in the market in this country for many years but uh, now disappeared because nobody's going outside and staying uh, in the field overnight uh, well going back to these compounds they are very serious compounds may making a lot of uh, morbidity and mortality all over the world uh, we can't in this country we face it uh, you know, with those people who work in the field of agriculture they being uh, exposed to these compounds while they doing uh, insecticide application to the crop and uh, they probably uh, would have some dermal or ingestion uh, uh, incidents uh, would then present with clinical features to the clean to the casualty department now uh, Carbamates and organophosphates are relatively old compounds uh, and the various names. Uh, organophosphate invented into market for more than 50 years, but uh, carbamates, a new one, which is a shortly acting one, uh, a bit safer, uh, although with the same mortality, uh, being introduced only 20 years ago. Well, uh, they probably make a lot of morbidity and mortality, as we mentioned. The Popular names like malathion or parathion, probably you hit them, uh, and there is a long list of names. In fact, they have a variety of activities and effectiveness. A few of them are lipid solubles, others are fat soluble, but in the end, they cause cholinergic excess and activity in the body. Um, well, others like the famous ride. This spray is probably available in the market, and you might have it home. Uh, it's made of uh, a pyrethroid. This is another one of the organophosphate that's very important and is a potent ant and cockroach killer. Uh, don't forget that it has a good side. The flipping of the coin will show you that uh, that even good medications like permethrin, which is used in uh, treatment of scabies, was derived from uh, uh, pyrethroid, which is one of the organophosphates. And kick, as we mentioned, is a mosquito repellent. It's not a spray. You can't put it on the skin. It's not absorbed through the skin. And it works as a repellent effectively. Uh, going further into the epidemiology, uh, you find that uh, almost 3 million exposure incidents are reported all over the world because of organophosphate poisoning. 3 million is a very big number. It's just a similar number to coronavirus infections nowadays. Well, uh, among these 3 million, there might be some 300,000 deaths. Probably you don't see them because the majority of them are in the developing countries like India and Pakistan and Southeast Asia. But uh, when you go to this report, is an, a re study done in India, you find that this is organophosphates making 35% of the whole uh, incidence of toxicity in the country. Then snake bite, they have a lot of snakes there. And probably you find kerosene is making a lower percentage. Probably they don't use kerosene. And drug intoxication and alcohol intoxication is not a major problem in India. And this is a special predilection to India. In fact, probably we had a, we had a different and we have a different figure in the future for our country. Uh, we have too many kerosene poisoning in this country. And uh, snake is not a major dilemma here. Uh, and probably alcohol is not... But going to the developed systems, you might see a different picture. To let you know that the mode of action is various and exposure, uh, source of exposure are different, there might be some ingestion, there might be inhalation or absorption through the skin. All of these clinical presentations might come to you. But the strange one is that uh, the one that's being reported just last year in Virginia, United States, it's being used now... Uh, in few cases like a couple of cases as an illicit drug that's a strange one because basically we know how this happens most of the time it's an accidental ingestion or exposure through inhalation or skin contact to the organophosphate especially in the field of agriculture this is the common scenario in our country but in certain situations you might find it as an 
uh, intentional use like a suicidal activity or homicidal activity you probably need to kill someone if you put some of the organophosphate in his food this is another sort of presentation but as an illicit drug it's rather fresh information only present in this lecture not last year's uh, anyhow it makes a bit of abnormal behavior or abnormal feeling and sensation and uh, people who are addict they might like that experience so they try it why not few people try smelling glue and drinking alcohol or drinking even petrol and kerosene but uh, this one is a new era in the field of uh, illicit drugs as i mentioned there's a lot of uh, uh, names and the organophosphate and carbamate but I don't like to bother you with them how do they work when you go back to the physiology you find that acetylcholine is a major neurotransmitter here in many presynaptic uh, ganglions or uh, connections now in the ganglia there are also some kind of uh, neurotransmission but uh, Probably the kind of the transmitter receptors are different. They, we have muscarinic receptor and the nicotinic receptor for the cholinergic system. The postsynaptics of the parasympathetic are close to the target organ, but in the sympathetic system is a bit different, that we have a well-established ganglion, especially those of the sympathetic chain alongside the vertebrae. But in the end, they would have activities through epinephrine and norepinephrine. On the target organs this is the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic probably you know this piece of information from your basics of physiology but anyhow uh, even the sympathetic system can use a style calling uh, in certain parts like in the skin to induce diaphoresis it means production of sweat going back to the somatic system you you probably find that my neural junction also uses a style calling and this is another spot of activity in the fourth level we have the central nervous system the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is widely distributed and might have diverse effect in certain parts of the nervous system now this is the background physiology let's go to the fat of physiology what happens if this acetylcholine was excessively working why do they work excessively because simply Organophosphates and carbamate are going to stop and inhibit choline esterase. That's the enzyme responsible for the degradation or stopping the effect of acetylcholine on the second order neuron. So whenever there is inhibition of that inhibitor, then the end result would be exaggeration. So there would be parasympathetic outflow or cholinergic outflow, more truly saying that it's a cholinergic outflow. That's and the, the parasympathetic system mainly and partly in the sympathetic system as i am pointing with my arrow and don't forget the somatic and the nervous system are also involved because this enzyme cholinesterase is widely distributed in the body and inhibition of this enzyme would lead to cholinergic excess in those spots now that was the background let's go just a bit downward and see how pathophysiology starts here excessive Parasympathetic cholinergic effects would come up with bradycardia, bronchoconstriction, meiosis, smooth muscle contraction. Meiosis means constriction of the pupils. While in the sympathetic system, activation through the cholinergic system ends up with midriasis rather than constriction. There will be dilatation of the pupil. There will be tachycardia rather than bradycardia. You see? Then will be hypertension. There will be bronchodilatation instead of bronchoconstriction and there would be diaphoresis in the sympathetic system or the somatic system there would be myoneural junction of activity there would be irritability of the muscles and sort of fasciculation and weakness more importantly in the brain and the spinal cord acetylcholine overactivation or the cholinergic excess ends up with agitation confusion coma seizure respiratory depression and all of these presentations here, they can make a constellation of clinical toxidrome instead of a syndrome. Now this is a delicate explanation of how this happens. This is a presynaptic neuron. Acetyl, choline, made of acetyl and choline, are released into the synaptic cleft. Now they go to the targets that are 
you see these yellow squares they are receptors for acetylcholine and these rectangles are choline esterase inhibitors they stop acetylcholine from ongoing and continuous stimulation of these receptors and preventing excessive of a stimulation of the second order neuron so these acetylcholines are connecting or combining to both esterase and the receptor and the esterase is going to split them up to choline and acetyl and then stopping or blocking these receptors hence they get rid of these free acetylcholine in this cleft so stopping or limiting the effect of cholinergics on the system what happens here in organophosphate poisoning is that these OPs or the organophosphate compounds are going to combine with the cholinesterase instead of acetylcholine they stop this combination that's the natural one so this pathologic process is going to stop this combination letting acetylcholine to go straight forward to the receptors doing it without limits and this would be exaggerated response in the second order neuron Unluckily, these combination would be irreversible for the time or the half lifetime of cholinesterase. And sometimes for the variety of these compounds, there would be some variable duration of activity on these cholinesterases. And as I mentioned, there's a long list of these compounds and might have variable duration of effects of toxicity on the body. The third diagram is showing how the blockage effect of oxime, this is the paramount or the major name of pralidoxime, how these stop organophosphates from the effect on the cholinesterases. They're going to combine to the organophosphates instead. They relieve these acetylcholine to combine to the receptors and to the esterases to have activation, to have splitting to have an end for the ongoing effect on that uh, organ. So there would be limitation of the cholinergic outflow through the uh, use of oxymes to stop the toxicity. The difference between organophosphate and, com and carbamates are not too much. Organophosphates are older ones, they presented before the carbamates, and carbamates are shorter acting. They made it into the industry hoping that this short activity, like two days only, would be less toxic. But in fact, they found that the mortality is almost the same of the organophosphates. Probably this helps in terms of practicality of use of certain insecticides, but as a toxic effect on human beings, it's the same. Clinical features. Clinical presentation depends on the mode of administration. Exposure through the skin is coming a bit late with clinical features. Ingestion and inhalation come a bit earlier, and these would be in hours, in fact. And once you have these and you have the compound, specific compound has different uh, presentation to another. Like certain lycophilic compounds, for example, malathion, is the famous one of the organophosphate would have some delayed onset for even up to days after the uh, exposure and the protracted course like prolonged course of illness like for tens of days but this is the reason why these fat soluble compounds are settling down in the adipose tissue and would be released later on in sort of redistribution to the plasma making late onset clinical presentations now the toxidromes are, are divided into three, acute toxicity, intermediate neurologic syndrome, and delayed neuropathy. When you see acute toxicity in contrast to the other two toxidromes, these are neurologic. So more or less organophosphate toxicity is respiratory or the cardiovascular one in terms of acute toxicity, but major thing is that it's neurologic or neuropathologic, neuropsychiatric in the long term and the intermediate term ways. Acute toxicity. Now, a patient presenting with clinical features of uh, uh, cholinergic excess, now how this cholinergic excess would express itself? As we mentioned in the first few slides, they will present with cholinergic excess of parasympathetic system 
meiosis, bradycardia, lacrimation, salivation, bronchorrhea, means excessive fluid in the bronchus or production of mucus, bronchospasm, urination, there would be emesis, vomiting and diarrhea. So there is fluid loss from every part of the body, from the eyes, from the mouth, from the lungs, from the gut and the urine as well. Diaphoresis or sweating is mediated through the sympathetic system. Well, then we have probably some sympathetic overactivation like mediriasis and tachycardia. So don't forget that sometimes even with organophosphate you don't see meiosis. You probably see mediriasis instead of that. You don't see bradycardia. You see tachycardia instead. This is more or less depending on the individual organophosphate with which the individual being intoxicated. Bronchorrhea is a very important sign because it indicates severity of the condition and indicates that the patient probably needs ventilatory support because it eventually goes to pulmonary edema and respiratory failure. Now we can we can take this into uh, of making some mnemonic. There are a couple of mnemonic in the references for cholinergic excess. We have sludge mnemonic and we have dumbbells. I omitted sludge because it doesn't help, it's not conclusive. Dumbbells is better than that. And in the end, it depends on your clinical judgment and experience. Diarrhea, urination, meiosis, bradycardia, constriction, excitation, lacrimation, lethargy, and salivation. These comes for these words and abbreviated up. These clinical features are very important in the diagnosis. The other thing in acute co toxicity is cardiac complications. Not uncommonly we see in up to one third of patients presenting with cardiac complications, namely myocardial ischemia because of multiple factors, poor oxygenation, hypovolemia, hypoxia, and many things. In fact, we need to say that there is non-occlusive coronary heart disease in this situation. Coronaries are intact, but myocardial ischemia happens. The second thing in cardiac events is the development of prolongation of QT interval. And this would end up with ventricular tachycardias and fibrillation. So patients should be washed up very carefully for those complications because all the time you might miss them. And should patient being treated very well for his pulmonary complications and cholinergic excess, he might be lost because of cardiac complications that are unnoticed. Respiratory complications are diverse and they are widespread and it's the major cause of death. Organophosphate poisoning causes depression of the respiratory center, suppression of the muscles that are responsible for respiration, namely diaphragm, and the major problem inside the airways, bronchorrhea and bronchoconstriction, which eventually go into pulmonary edema. Then these factors might be intermingling with hypovolemia because of loss of fluid from everywhere, then hypoxia, and hypoxia to every part of the body, then going and hitting other target organs like the brain and the kidneys. Secondarily, other organs might be affected, but primarily it's the respiratory system. Respiratory complications is the major cause of fatality, especially in severe, uh, severe intoxication. These are major acute toxicity syndromes, but we need to have other, we might need to know that we have two other presentations, the intermediate and the delay. The intermediate one presenting within a few days, and it's lasting for a few weeks. Basically, it's because of intoxication with these organophosphate compounds that are lipophilic. They go to be dissolved into the fatty tissue of the body, and then redistribute again after a few days and making symptoms. These compounds are responsible for making these neurological problems. The intermediate syndrome would present with weakness of muscles, namely neck muscles causing weakness of flexion, causing weakness of the tendon reflexes, cranial nerve would be involved and unfortunately there might be some proximal muscle weakness and eventually respiratory failure. Luckily, intermediate neurologic syndrome would resolve within a few weeks. If the patient was supported with ventilatory support for a few weeks, he might probably overwhelm that 
hurdle and in the end survive. In contrast to the intermediate one, delayed one has more gloomy picture. The delayed one would be, would be abbreviated into organophosphate induced delayed neuropathy and sometimes there is neuropsychiatric one as well. So opiidin would present in fact few weeks from the exposure to the toxic compound and again just like the intermediate one it depends on that compound itself certain compounds that are making this opiidin not necessarily making having had some kind of acute toxicity in the beginning they might have some trivial picture in the beginning but in fact they prevent present with a grave neurological deterioration later on few weeks later on the organ TOCP that organophosphate is making even trivial toxicity in the beginning but they present with this grave picture in the uh, following few weeks why this happens it's diverse. it's diverse it's not similar to the toxicity in the beginning it works on a certain other enzyme that's a neuro neuropathy target esterase another esterase that's widely distributed inside the nervous system the central nervous system now this enzyme once inhibited it ends up with a pathologic process of degeneration of the nerves especially the long axons in the process of Wallerian degeneration as you might probably remember from your lectures of pathology a couple of years ago the affected nerves would end up with clinical pictures of glove and stocking neuropathy they would be painful paresthesia of glove and stocking distribution in the hands and the feet this neuropathy which is a sensory one eventually goes into motor neuropathy there would be some flaccid paralysis from the lower limb ascending up and might cripple the patient ending up with some diverse motor disability poor functions some kind of uh, permanent disability and weakness spasticity and pictures of upper motor neuron syndrome if you had to confirm this diagnosis you need to have some electromyogram it shows some decreased firing of the motor neuron unit and the clinical picture and history would support the diagnosis unfortunately few survived people from this opioidal syndrome suffered from mental problems like loss of memory and lack of abstraction and few patients had Parkinsonism as well how are we going to diagnose this presentation history is good but not available every time as few patients might not remember his exposure few other patients might present in coma and nobody witnessed that so you have to be vigilant about the initial diagnosis the key for the diagnosis is to find evidences of cholinergic excess that are good having meiosis is very good for the diagnosis but unluckily not every patient have meiosis and bradycardia few patients might have instead tachycardia uh, uh, midriasis and tachycardia so even with absence of history symptoms of cholinergic excess would suggest the diagnosis the dumbbells are, are very good mnemonic for the cholinergic excess symptoms few patients might have gallic odor in their breath this would help too much still doubt in there go to do a dropping challenge give the patient one or two milligrams IV slowly and wait for anticholinergic side effects if you couldn't witness them then the diagnosis is likely because you might expect these side effect in a normal one unless there is some ongoing cholinergic excess and some ongoing inhibition of the choline esterases. lab tests are not helpful at the time don't waste your time for lab tests because it's not available everywhere and it's needing time in fact once you needed to di diagnose a patient and manage then lab give you, give you, gives you the answer in several hours the second thing is that we need activity of the acetylcholine rather than the level you probably see normal level of acetylcholine esterase but when you calibrate the activity you find it had lost more than 50 percent 
So activity is rather difficult to be estimated in the laboratory than the level. But level probably help you in the initial diagnosis. And all the th most of the time, don't forget that you might not need that level for the diagnosis. It's just straightforward. Don't forget that we need RBC cholinesterase rather than the plasma one. That's the pseudo one. And we need to do activity study. And this would gauge the diagnosis, gauge the, the management. Because in the ongoing steps of treatment, when you give treatment, you give oxime, you need to know how much the activity is escalating or improving. How do we have to manage those patients? Initial resuscitation is very important. Yes? Right. Those patients are liable to get respiratory failure very quickly because of the multiple factors on the respiratory system we mentioned in the beginning. So you have to give oxygen concentration a very high one, like 100%, which is established only with these kind of intervention like early intubation and probably the patient need mechanical ventilation those with depressed consciousness would have this indication immediately but those we have who have intact consciousness still they need to have a low threshold to intubation intubate them and very low threshold to get mechanical ventilation because they get to respiratory failure very quickly in contrast to ca other cases like pneumonia and pulmonary edema in those cases we need to have some probably depressed consciousness and certain other criteria. But here, consciousness is not a, not a, a, a paramount finding to be evident in order to decide on putting the patient on mechanical ventilation. Cholinergic toxicity would be treated with atropine. Here you give higher doses of atropine, like 2 to 5 milligrams, and being repeated every few minutes until full atropinization is achieved. And probably you need to, you probably give a patient hundreds of milligrams of this compound to stop the ongoing cholinergic activity. The gauge and the caliber for the improvement of response would not be mediasis and tachycardia. If a patient being given atropine and his heart rate going up to 100, don't be mistaken and say that that is a good dose. No. Respiratory findings are the cardinal things to tell you that the dose is good. There would be disappearance of the bronchia, bronchorrhea, disappearance of the bronchospasm and the reason bronchi. These findings are directing the individual to say that this is a good dose, rather than tachycardia and mediasis. Pralidoxines or the two pans are good. They reverse the effect of organophosphate on the cholinesterases, but they should only be established or done once the patient had resuscitation and had atropinization already done. Pralidoxime are given IV slowly, rapid administration causes heart attacks and sometimes causes transient suppression of the cholinesterase enzyme. It means transient exacerbation of symptoms. So atropine should be there to protect the patient because this one is stopping or blocking the mascarinic receptors and this one is working on the mascarinic and the nicotinic receptors. Decontamination is important. Probably it will be done in the first step. But you can start with these things and don't forget decontamination because these might take only a few minutes to start. Decontamination is getting rid of the clothes and any of the organophosphate left on the skin. Washing the skin clearly and doing a bit of irrigation to the eyes and nose. It was on the skin. And getting rid of the clothes. Don't use them back again. Gastric lavage is not favored. It should be done only in early patients who came in less than one hour. And there's a lot of risk of induction of vomiting so there would be aspiration going into the lungs those lungs who were suffering from bronchorrhea and pulmonary edema might suffer again from gastric acids and that's not a good judgment activated charcoal is only for those who ingested the compound not for those who had it on the skin and this only would be done when the patient presents early lastly cardiac complications you have to watch them 
we have the you have to watch the patient for arrhythmias and ischemias so we need to have some serial ECGs we need to have troponin being done every now and then and treat them accordingly we don't have any problem with ischemia because the coronaries are not blocked and there's, there is non-occlusive coronary disease and the prolongation of acute interval that I mentioned in the beginning is making a lot of problems like arrhythmias they can be treated with magnesium this is the last but not the least of the lecture and I am hoping the best for the next for you.